All right, we are going to prove a very useful fact in analysis, and that's the infimum is equal to the negative of the supremum of the negative. So basically, basically, um, the way that I think about this is you can sort of prove this in like two seconds using a picture. So imagine you have the real line here, and you have some set A, um, which is bounded below. So that means I don't know what the set looks like. It's some subset here, so maybe it's like uh, it has like some numbers here, and then there's like a gap, and there's some numbers here, and maybe it's like a little fuzzy. Like in, in this region, it contains some of these points, but not all of them, and maybe you also like it's missing a few points here. I don't know. Um, general subsets of real numbers and just general, yeah, general subsets of real numbers can look really weird. But whatever the set is, it's bounded below, which means that it has some lower bound. I'll just circle it here. So this point is a lower bound. And then when you take the, and, and this is, of course, this is the set A then if you want to take negative a, you just flip everything about the, um, about zero. So if we assume that like, let's assume that like this is zero actually, and let's redo this. So let's say that zero is there. It doesn't really matter all that much. Um, doesn't really matter where zero is. You're, you'll essentially be flipping it in either, no matter how you do it. But basically what you'll have now is when you, when you f take negative a, you've basically, you've basically just flipped everything. And so this thing that was your, in that was your lower bound, you take its negative and it becomes an upper bound. And so that's essentially, um, so this would be, oh wait, bounded below here. So if, let's say this is the infimum here, and this is the supremum here. So this is the infimum of A, and this is the um, supremum of negative A, which is just the negative of the infimum of A. And of course, if the supremum of negative a is the infimum of, is negative the infimum of a, then you can just move that minus sign over, and you get this. And that's what we want to prove. So, that's how, at, at least for me as a visual thinker, that's how I picture this. But now what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to sort of, if you have this visual intu intuition, you need to translate this into mathematical logic. Okay, so let's start taking things that were given and converting them into math things or math. Okay, so A is bounded since A is bounded below. Um, it's infimum exists. So there exists some alpha, which is the infimum of A. This means that, first of all, since it's a lower bound, uh, for all x and A, alpha is less than or equal to x. Um, and then furthermore, the fact that it's a it's, it's the infimum means that if x happens to be greater than a, it, no, if x is in a and if x is in a and x happens to be greater than alpha, then x is not a lower bound for a. Okay, so that's that's what we know. That's all the information that we're given. And we're going to use this to prove that the supremum of negative a is 
negative the infimum of a. So, let's see here. So we know what the set negative a is um, since alpha is in a, obviously negative alpha is contained in minus a. So now we want to prove that, um, okay, so let, let me state what I'm going to prove. I claim that negative alpha is the supremum of minus a. To prove that minus alpha, so we need to prove that minus alpha is an upper bound for minus a, and we also need to prove that for any element of minus a which is less than minus alpha, that that particular element of minus a is not an upper bound for minus a. So to prove that minus alpha is, I, I might have said lower bound when I meant upper bound. What I, I meant to say whatever the correct one is. So to prove that minus alpha is an upper bound for minus a, let y be in minus a. Then there exists some x in a such that minus x equals y. That's just by, we know that such an element of a is, such an element x of a is guaranteed to exist by the fact that y is contained in minus a. Um, then we know that alpha is less than or equal to x, and that's because alpha is a lower bound for a. And so we negate everything and we get minus alpha is greater than or equal to minus x. And let's see here. Um, and this is equal to y. So, um, so y is less than or equal to minus a, minus alpha, and this holds for all y in minus a, and thus minus a is an upper, no, minus alpha is an upper bound for minus a. Not sure why I'm mixing up a lot of these words, but whatever. Okay, so next, suppose y is less than a. Um, Suppose minus alpha is greater than y, which is some element of minus a. Again, we know that y can be written as minus x, where x is some element of a. All right, so minus alpha is greater than minus well, it's greater than y, which is equal to minus x. And this implies that, well, we can just negate this inequality and it reverses the direction. So alpha is less than x. So let's see here, x is less than, x is greater than alpha, um, which means that x is not a lower bound for a. All right, so x is not a lower bound for a. So what does this imply? So, is not the case that to be a lower bound means that f to be a lower bound of a set means that every element of the set is greater than or equal to that element. So, it is not the case that for every single z in A, 
that z must be greater than or equal to alpha. No, x is not a lower bound for a. So x is not less than or equal to every. So it is not the case that for every single element of a, x is less than or equal to, for every single element z and a, x is less than or equal to z. So if it's not the case that this is true for every single element, then there must be some element in a such that x is less than or equal to, no, such that it's not the case that x is less than or equal to z. So in this case, such that z is strictly less than x. Okay, so there is some z in a such that z is strictly less than x. So negative z is in minus a, and let's see here, so negative z is greater than minus x. Again, we're just taking that previous inequality and negating it. So minus z is greater than minus x, but minus x equals y. So what does this mean? This means that y is not an um, upper bound. No, and yeah, so y is not an upper bound for minus a. And again, this holds for every single y in minus a such that y is less than negative alpha. And that's the second property that we need to know about um, that's a, that confirms the second property that we needed in order to conclude that minus a is in fact the supremum of, my, that minus alpha is the supremum of minus a. So now we've concluded that minus alpha is the supremum of minus a. And in fact, I'm going to write this in a way that makes it a little easier to work with. Ugh, let me just, okay. So thus, the supremum of minus a is equal to negative alpha. But alpha is the infimum of a. And then, hence, negating both sides, wait. So this equals minus the infimum of a. And negating both sides of this equation, we get the infimum of a is equal to negative the supremum of minus a. And let's, so the basic, what did we really do here? Basically, the fact that um, when you f go from infimum to supremum, you have to throw in these negative signs. What this really comes down to is this is really all based on the fact that a less than b is equivalent to negative a is greater than negative b. We use this inequality like multiple times throughout this proof and it's really what everything in the proof relied on. Um, is is this, this sort of symbolic equivalence of a less than b equivalent to negative a greater than negative b. And just by using this a whole bunch of times, we were able to get to this relationship between the infimum of a set and the supremum of um, the, uh, the minus of the set. And that's it. That's all we need to prove. And so we are done.